My name is Sean Thomas, and I'm the author of Be More Today, a 40-day guide to a better version of you. As a doctor of physical therapy, I've seen thousands of people do great things. They came to me with ailments, physical ailments, pain, issues, and they got through them, all because they decided in their mind they were going to do it. And I guarantee you, if you just trust the process and be persistent, you too can be the best version of you. Have you ever been out and about with nowhere to stash your keys and ID so you can be hands-free? Whether you're running errands, traveling, or hitting the trail, Spy Belt is the belt that goes where you go. Made with stretchable fabric and a low-profile design, Spy Belt is your perfect companion to keep your essentials secure without bouncing or chafing. Choose from several prints and colors in the original, a wider band in the pro versions, or the newest Spy Belt, White Out, an all-white belt that is perfect for summer. Visit www.spybelt.com to get your spy belt today. Run smart, run free, run with spy belt. Don't let aches and pains hold you back from living your life. At Jack Physical Therapy, our experienced clinicians create a personalized treatment plan that fits each and every patient's needs uniquely. Whether it's recovering from an injury or enhancing your performance, we've got you covered. With over 150 locations throughout New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, there is sure to be a JAG physical therapy location near you. Visit JAGPT.com and book an appointment today to get back the life you love. That's JAGPT.com. JAGPT.com. Welcome to the BMO Today Show. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our show today. Now, let's hear it from our host, Dr. Sean Thomas. What's going on, folks? Your boy again, Dr. Sean Thomas, back in the building with the Be More Today show. We are back. We are back. We are back in the building, folks. And we are here in the month of September, a beautiful time of the year. The fall is upon us, and we are rocking out. So excited to be here and to continue to be more today's show now in season five of this show. So bringing our 10-year anniversary of Be More Today. It's been 10 years, folks. We've been doing things, trying to be more in various ways. And I got to just say thank you for your love and support. It does not go unnoticed. We have been doing here things on here for a number of years uh, to keep people moving and grooving and to remind everyone that they can be more in not just 24, but in all ways for their lives. As you know, Be More Today is a movement. Be More Today.com has my more merch on there, our podcast show, uh, our YouTube page, our Facebook page, our Facebook group, so many things to stay inspired. And if you want to hear the show again on Spotify and our podcast mainly, but again, now heard in 86 countries, over 64,000 downloads. Again, you have put the show on the map, and I appreciate you for your love and support. It does not go unnoticed. A quote for today is simple, as always. We cling to the wreckage of the past for fear of the uncharted future. But by letting go, we open up our hands to receive what life has to offer by Melody Betty. I don't know about you, but this has been a year for me where I've been trying to put things aside, really trying to move forward and not hold on to uh, past experiences, um, things that can kind of hold you back from seeing your future, seeing your growth, seeing your more, right? Uh, we get so fixated on what we could have, should have, would have done. And I talk about this in my book a, a lot, just the, the should have, would have, could have that always come around that kind of hold us back from our true potential and not letting go of the past to really let our hands be open for either what God has for us, what you have in store for you, the goals you want to hit, holding on to the, the former you, the things you used to do, the races you used to run, right? All these different things. We use that phrase so many times. We're really looking forward to what we can do, not just in terms of our personal lives and our physical lives, but also for our community, for our churches, for our families, for our jobs. And I thought to myself, who could I bring on the show this week to talk about um, not just legacy, but also just talking about ways to be great in your own space and ways to find ways to be great for those around you. And one name came to mind, Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn. Now, for folks, if you don't know who she is, she's a rock star, a licensed clinical social worker, speaker, consultant, and educator. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Social Work from Medgar Ellis College, a Master of Social Work at Hunter College, and a Doctor of Social Work degree at the University of Southern California with a research focus on the impact of systemic oppression on Black mental health. Let's go. Dr. Llewellyn has an extensive experience within mental health care and is passionate about mental health through the lens of race, 
oppression, and power. Her experience includes creating structural change through the social justice work, working with clients to increase wellness and decrease racial trauma, and activating students for social justice engagement. Folks, I'm super excited about this week's show. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the stage my friend and our newest guest on Be More Today show, Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn. Tiffany, what is going on? Hey, man. Thank you so much for having me here. Congrats on 10 years. That's amazing. Um, I'm excited to be here in the conversation we're going to have. I appreciate you so much. Uh, you and I have many ties to each other, indirectly and directly. I know your mama. Um, mm -hmm. Your mama and I were elders at a church together. Um, and you were there clearly in passing because you were doing so many things. Right. But I had a chance to really meet you and, and really meet you better as I attended a number of workshops that you were putting on uh, that were social justice based. And uh, me and my whole group of friends, my wife, who was so excited to be there, had a really a chance to really see you in action and to see you really get down with what you are blessed with your ministry, with with your purpose, with your drive, with your passion, um, along with uh, people like Jamie Callisar and others who are doing great, great things in terms of um, looking at ways that we can be better for our communities inside the church and outside the church. So I'm just happy to really be able to talk to you today, connect with you, and talk about the ways we can be better for ourselves and for each other. So before I get started, I want to just say, I think you're great. And um, I, I want to talk about your business now, talk about your wellness and consulting business. Talk to us about what this business is and the great work you're doing uh, on your own right now. Yeah, so I own and operate a private practice called the Well and Wellness and Consulting. Um, it is a mental health service agency. And so what we do, what I do there is I provide individual couples, family therapy um, for just members of our community who are seeking to, one, really improve their overall wellness and care and explore what it means to be well. Do I even know how to answer that question? How do we, you know, develop the skills and tools to maintain relationships, improve our families, which in turn, you know, creates a more healthier society. I also do a lot of consulting work um, across different universities, working with students of color, working with institutions to systemic structures really influence mental health care for students, for staff of color, um, how to create more equitable interventions within their organizations or schools or businesses. And so that's just a little bit of the work that I do on the side through my practice. I love it. I love it. I'm always curious when people start to say, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing and make it the way I want to do it, right? To make it the way that I wanted to make it in terms of structure, in terms of change, uh, effectiveness and all these things. What really inspired you to say, you know what? I see what's happening around here and I want to do it this way because this is the way I think can be impactful for my community. What really inspired you to go out there and say, I want to do this? Yeah, you know, I've been a therapist for a long, long time, almost 15 years. And when you work within certain settings, some of which I'm still connected to, you are forced to operate for your people within a structure that may or may not actually work. Um, and a lot of times the interventions, the approaches to therapy that I feel like Black people benefit from, that our research shows that we benefit from or what our community is asking for, we don't have the freedom and the power to implement that within a lot of existing spaces. Mm. Um, and so I really wanted to create my own uh, practice where I can center us and I can center our community, our culture, I can look at the research of what's influencing and impacting Black mental health. I can look at some of the traditional and non-traditional practices really work for us. And of course, it's not a monolith. It's a lot of different strategies, but just having the freedom to be able to create and to serve in a way that is impactful. And that was my sole motivator, that we don't have enough black practices, we don't have enough um, for people of color therapists and so the more we can create for ourselves the better our people can get healed because we are centering us in the work that we do 
And that's consistently my key motivator. Yeah, that's big. You know, I think it's it's beautiful to walk into a a setting like that, a safe space, and see someone who looks like you, can understand your perspective, can understand your history, your culture. Um, I find so many times, just looking back on my 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 schooling, so many people that I interacted with were not people of color, and I I went to a, a number of um, public inst- or sorry private institutions that were. Um, I was always a minority. Uh, so when it, when it came to anything, even my advisors, the number of advisors I've had through high school, through college, even through grad school, you know, none of them looked like me ever, ever, ever. So being able to talk to a healthcare provider that looks like you, even in physical therapy, when people come in here and they ask, so who's, who's the manager here? And I say, it's me. They go, wow. They're, they're blown away by that. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's great. But I never really understand the impact of that until someone points it out. So I'm sure for you, being able to connect with people on this mental level where they're able to share their experience with you and you can give them so much confidence, you can give them so much experience, knowing that where they're coming from is where you can understand and you can relate. It has to be breathtaking. It has to be life-changing. So um, what, are, what are some of the things that you've seen in terms of you know, coming out of COVID-19 now, people are back to work, they're doing certain things, but we still have all these underlying... <laughs> And traumatic experiences that continue to happen, right? I think during COVID-19, it was easier to see things because everything shut down. So when things happened, it was like, wow, it's in your face. Whoa. But now that we're getting back to doing things somewhat back to normal, there's still things happening, right? There's still shootings. There are still uh, multiple instances where people are put on blast and race is always going to be at the forefront of certain things. So the trauma is still there, but we're still kind of moving like life is going on as normal, but it's not. What are your thoughts on, you know, the people you've been working with and how we as people can continue to combat and deal with the racial traumas that are happening on a regular day basis? Yeah, you know, that's that's a heavy question because it's intergenerational. It's existed even beyond um, the pandemic. During the pandemic, you know, we talked about being in the midst of two pandemics because there was George Floyd and COVID happening at the same time. And so for our people, we were faced with multi levels of trauma. Um, And, you know, the research also shows us that for Black people, when a racially motivated event happens, the the mental health impact in terms of anxiety, depression, hopelessness, last for up to one to two years, mm. right? And so even though we have technically come out of the pandemic, whatever that means, right. it's been consistent. And and without nerding out too much here, it is so layered in that even in our sleep, where I like to talk about Black sleep, Black people are not even experiencing the level of rest of that the human body needs because of this consistent level of stress that the body is under. The central nervous system is constantly activated. The uh, prefrontal cortex is unable to even come online in a healthy way. We live in a state of uh, fight, flight, freeze, um, speed. That's even been extended now. And so before even able to catch our breath on one event, there is another, and there is another, and there's another. And so actually, black bodies never really get the chance to reset or come back to healthy basically. And so how we are um, is much deeper than what we even understand is going on, right? And so like you said, there's been so much more that's happened that's just added and taken the stress levels higher and higher. And so part of my work with um, my clients or even my community outside of the private practice space is one to educate people around what's actually happening when we talk about racial trauma, when we talk about our mental health, when we talk about how we think we're well, and when we say, you know, this is just who I am, this is just who I function, well, do we actually understand what's happening, Um, not just to black skin, but beneath black skin? right in the level of activation that we live under and so how can we increase our wellness how can we utilize rest as um, our right as a form of resistance um, as the page in that ministry talked about 
how can we develop the skills and tools to increase our, in, increase our self-esteem and confidence in what we call positive racial identity. Because when these shootings and killings happen, it is a form of dehumanization, right? It's a stripping of ourselves because you look at this person who looks like you, who looks like your auntie, your uncle, your brother, your father, your husband, and you know that the only difference is that it wasn't you in that moment. There are no other circumstances necessary and that in and of itself is stress producing and it dehumanizes. And so how do we come back into ourselves? How do we pour back into our children, into our families? How do we build positive racial identity and learn to love ourselves again? How do we develop language, the most important piece for what we are experiencing? To be able to name that when you come home and you are overwhelmed and stressed and you don't even know why, that you can communicate to your family, to your community, what is actually happening with you and take the necessary steps and skills that you need to just manage and cope. I think to keep it very realistic in that there's no way to mental health our way out of systemic oppression, right? Mm. And so... What that means is that we have to figure out a way to cope and to manage throughout until things change. Hopefully we get to see an equitable society in our lifetime. But what does that look like to know that your skin is a target? You enter into society and into systems that want to dehumanize you. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out a way to be well even within that. And that is a high act. Um, and so that's, that's really a lot of what the work looks like. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I am connecting with you on so many levels right now. I'm just thinking about social media and all that we see on social media nowadays, you know, before it was, you know, if you're watching TV or hearing the news, you may hear it, but now literally on every social platform, even from the, the Sonia shooting in Springfield, um, <laughs> There's so many things that are happening. You're seeing these things and they're popping up. Even if you don't want to see them, they're popping up in your feeds. They're popping up on, on various chats, on WhatsApp chats, right? Everyone's sharing and resharing, reposting. So even if you're trying to avoid these things to not have that trauma, it's being thrown at you to some extent, in some regard. And I think for me, sometimes it's overwhelming because, yeah, when you see people who look like you, it's it's traumatic because yeah, on any given day, that that could be me, that could be you, you know, depending on what's going on. And I think what bothers me even more, and maybe this is my own personal thing, but it's it's sometimes hard to even escape it when people are talking about it. And if you don't want to be part of the conversation, it's fine. But you know, people are talking about it, and they're talking about it in the context of that person. But I always internalize that. I internalize that. Oh well, they're, maybe they're talking about me or my people or whatever else, because they are. Although it's not me, it's still me, right? It could be me. It so yeah. it, it's almost it's almost hard to separate those things. And and I, I think the 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 levels are just so much higher now for this generation and the the next generation. I think about my daughter and what she may be going through as she grows up in this environment, you know. So having services like you're providing are crucial so that people can have a way out or a way to at least digest and process what they're seeing, what they're experiencing. Um so, you know, how can people reach out to you or connect with you if they want to benefit from your services or from your toolage? Yeah, so my website is uh, tlwellness.org. Um, anyone can find me there. Um, I, I wouldn't even say I'm on social media anymore in that particular way I am, but that's really the best way. You can always send me an email, info at llewellynwellness.org. Tiffany at LlewellynWellness.org. Those are the fastest ways to be able to reach out. Okay, awesome. So with all the work you're doing uh, on your personal level, you've done so much work in terms of community as well. And I really want to talk about advances for social justice because that's when I really saw you in action. I really saw you and your team doing some great things. You and I are both advances. I've had a number of advances on the show. Uh, for those, again, who don't know, uh, Christianity has a number of different facets. The Adventist Church is one component of that. We go to church on Saturday. For the most part, lots of similarities. Uh, but that's one of the biggest differences between us and other who go to church on, on Sunday. But one of the things that we've talked about on the show for my people who've been on the show is that we look at ways that our church can be a little more active in terms of looking at the issues that are outside of our four walls. And 
you've made a, a group or created a group called Events for Social Justice. So just talk to listeners about what that group has been uh, from its inception to now, if you can briefly, and you know why you felt there was a need for this in the first place. Yeah, so the need out of similarly like we were just talking about racialized events happening in the U.S., particularly when Philando Castile was murdered, uh, we were looking and waiting for a response, for a call to action, for some sort of direction from our church, and there was none. Um, and so a collective of us ended up having like a phone call that night. I was shocked that, you know, there were so many people, hundreds and hundreds of people that called in, other Adventists who had, you know, also felt this drive, this passion, this call to social justice, activism, to engagement. So what do we do? Where's our voice as a church? Um, and so from that, we were able to explore multiple iterations of what can this actually look like to invite our church to center social justice work um, as a part of our existence as Christians. I grew up in a very political family. We were Christians and engaged um, in politics. I was an Adventist, but there was never the separation identity-wise for me. And so that was always something that I struggled with also as a social um, and so FJ, we decided to center like education and create spaces for training, which is how we ended up doing different conferences and workshops. Um, and, you know, our leadership team will meet with multiple leaders across the denomination to try to create ASJ based churches. So churches that want to identify social justice churches churches who can do some research in their communities around the issues and the needs and create strategies and actions to actually be engaged in the way that Chris was engaged, right? And we spent a number of years trying to do that work and it just felt complicated and complex. Um, and there was a lot of resistance. Although and this is in its history as a, a core of social justice work in its history. And so it's really the question of where did we lose, right? Where did we become disengaged from that part of our identity? And is it possible to reclaim that? Um, and so we spent maybe five years really trying to push and educate and inform and activate our churches. And I think that the complexity of it called for us to really take some steps back and try to identify, is this possible, mm. right? Is, is our church, are our churches in, interested um, in doing this work? Why does this feel so hard and so complex? And might it be more beneficial for us to engage this work differently? And so I think that's a question that we continue to sit with. Um, we've lost um unfortunately through death a number of our leaders as well and so sitting with grief associated associated with that um and so i think we are in a space particularly this year that is such a big election year that is uh, a year that determines so much as it relates to the most marginalized where we are beginning to reconvene and re-explore how might we be able to re-engage our churches, our communities in this work um, at such a crucial time in our, in our world's, in our country's history? Um, well, somewhat I think I, I become a little disappointed, but I think I remain hopeful that we can get our identity as it relates to being Adventists who do social justice work and know that this is not a challenge to our beliefs. It is in line with our beliefs. It's in line with scripture. It's in line with Christ's method and Christ's way. Um, and so I'm excited to see what the future of ASJ can look like as we sort of reframe some of our work. Yeah. Well, I didn't know what the update was. You know, the last time I attended the conference was before COVID and it was so it was so invigorating. Uh, my wife, as you know, is a defense attorney, works yes. in Brooklyn. She left there hype. Uh, and, you know, for her, who, who was someone who came into the faith 
uh, at a, at a later age, right? Because she was raised mm-hmm. Hindu. Christianity always seemed very insular to her, especially yeah, Adventism, mm-hmm. in the sense that when everyone asked her why she was doing the work she's doing, you know, the, the defending criminals, as 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 some would say, but in her mind, mm-hmm. she's giving them the best situation that they can, and defending those that need to be defended. The law says, you know, innocent until proven guilty. It is not her job to. Uh, to find someone guilty is their job to give them the best case they can get and for the mm-hmm. um the prosecutors to prove that that person is again guilty because again instant into a group and guilty so that was her main mm-hmm. job and so many people in the church would give her well how can you look this person did this how can you defend that and mm-hmm. it's like you said it's right in line with what christ has been talking about right in terms of what god has and christ was doing on this earth defending those who needed defense uh standing up for those who needed standing up for and for her going to a conference like yours was eye-opening because for the first time she saw the 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 christian message in action so (laughs) she left there saying yo let me go and maybe i can do my own thing at my job or find something we can do in brooklyn and there was so much hype and i think like what you're right in terms of the the capacity for um Christian churches, maybe ours just in general, but it could be many as well, not being able to see the bigger picture of how Christ's life exemplifies what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do in that same regard. Helping those who need help, being a voice to the voiceless, giving power to those in need, and really helping community. And I'm not really sure, Tiff, why it's so challenging for church organizations, CBOs, faith or faith-based groups to to latch on to this thing. Um, Cause I, I get the same frustration that you, that you're feeling. There's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of resistance, a lot of, of change. And I, I sometimes feel like we, we feel more comfortable just sitting in our pews, sitting in our Absolutely. walls and, and feeding ourselves as opposed to actually going there and, and feeding others. So I'm a little sad to hear that the, the shift has happened even in terms of your group, but I'm, I'm reassured that I guess, you know, it, it sounds like you're hopeful that that a shift can happen especially during such a time as this with an election year at hand yeah. you know it, it's, it's so important for us to be a little more active and in, 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 in looking at what we can do to help those who are around us not just not just help ourselves so yeah and if i can just add really quickly to this piece of why because i think you know as an educator as a social worker i'm trying to get to the root cause right we're doing this work and there's a resistance so why what's at the point? of the resistance. And I think there is an ideology within Adventism specifically, because there are a lot of other faith uh, groups and denominations who center social justice work, right? But in our denomination, we struggle. Um, and I think we hold an ideology that is about eschatology, about Christ's second coming and the poor. And so our focus is very heavenly. Our focus is very much about when Christ comes back, then the world will be better. And Mm -hmm. we just need to wait for God to come back. And we just have to live in these sorts of circumstances. It's just the result of sin. Um, And I think that ideology from our research, from our conversations, from engaging multiple different spheres of Adventism and facing the same sort of challenge, it, it is the idea of Christ will come and he will fix the earth mm. um, and cleanse the earth. And so we, our only responsibility is to prepare for that. And mm. so if we can help to shift the ideology, but to expand the ideology a little bit, to also include prices as of us to, you know, uh, do justice, what, you know, love, mercy, all these things, then we can see that Christ is not just asking us to wait for the second coming, but we actually have a job to do next to create a more equitable society. Um, and so that, I believe, is at the core of the resistance. Yo, that's a word right there. And, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I completely agree with you. I do think that that may be it. And that that's, I struggle with because... There are so many things that happen on a regular basis, right? There's so many everyday things that we're missing then. We're missing opportunities to reach out and talk to people who may be on our street struggling right now with certain situations, right now with certain issues. We're missing opportunities to join our communities who are marching for whatever reasons around our blocks, right? And as they're marching around their blocks, whether it's on Saturday or not, it's a whole nother thing by itself. 
but you know, whatever that that day may be, a number of other faith based organizations are out there, right? And they're supporting you. You walk around even Brooklyn, you see so many churches that have various flags that are are political some, but most of them are just supporting whatever the 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 people in the area need support with, right? Whether it's uh, people who are against gun violence or people who are against Oh, you know, even the Black Lives Matter thing, right? Where so many churches were putting up Black Lives Matter signs all over their churches. But for us, you know, that would be such a thing because if yeah. we did that, then, you know, what what does that mean? And I, I struggle with the the concept of us always thinking that we are part of the community. But then when it comes down to community things, we shy away from being a part of the community. So that that's just a struggle for me. And I know there are people in in various groups who do their own thing, and I salute those who do. And I'm not saying anything against those who don't, but I do think that you know if the church is really supposed to be a safe place, a place of a haven, right, for those to come and like it was originally for people to come and whatever their needs were, it's just to, to fulfill those needs, like like the word says. If there's a need, fill the need. If someone's hungry, give them food. If someone's thirsty, give them water. Uh, we should be doing those things. And if we're not, then what really is the purpose of, of the modern day church? Is it really for us just to come and to celebrate each other and, and to, 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 to worship and then go home? Or is it really to f- fulfill a need for those who are around us? And yeah, I, I'm in the same boat, Tip. I, I don't know uh, where to pick up where the ball drops, but we have yeah. to pick up the ball somewhere. hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Now you you mentioned a comment that I saw on social media and I had to repost it because it was pretty profound. And I just want to read part of it now just so I can understand what you were talking about. And mm-hmm. the comment was a little lengthy, but I'm just going to go back to one part. It says, does this denomination have a reputation of being loving, kind, accepting? Question mark. I do believe there's a new generation of SDA people and leaders who want change, though I'm hopeful about that. What do you think happens when an identity is built around being God's chosen remnant? Holy, a hold a monopoly on biblical truth when we discuss people as worldly and secular in your churches every week from the pulpit to the pews? What do you think happens when a denomination is prideful about being insular and forces a particular look on folks to be quote unquote godly? It's why we have high baptism rates and low retention rates. Now that that hit me in, in a variety of ways, just from someone who grew up in our church, from someone who um, understands the world. From uh, uh, I guess kind of like you, my my household was somewhat split. My my mom's and grandma and whoever else on my mom's side of seven events. My dad was not. They were born Baptists and, and Southern Baptists at that. So I grew up in a household that saw a variety of things, but all were Christ centered, just different perspectives. So my outlook on life is 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 kind of like that. I, I can see the beauty and benefit in in all forms of Christianity, all forms of faith, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. because I have so many friends who are Hindu and Buddhist, and you know, and there's so many similarities, yes, differences as well, but so many similarities in terms of what we all believe in terms of how we should be living, um, just as people, as humans on this earth. So when I saw your comment on there, it's it 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 resonated with me for a number of reasons because I feel like we can be doing so much more, not just a, as a church, but also just in terms of how we show kindness. And for one of the things that I, I, I've been focusing on this year is just, am I a kind person, right? With all the things that are happening in terms of racial disparities and, 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 and trauma that's happening in the world, I still am trying to find ways to be kind, even though the world is not kind to me, to us as black and brown people, et cetera. So what are your thoughts, Doc, in terms of, you know, why is it such a hard thing for us to do, to be kind in an environment that is supposed to be kind regardless, the same way that Christ was kind when he was here. But why is it so hard for us to do that, even though that's exactly what we should be doing in the first place? Yeah, you know, I think this, I've been on a similar journey around kindness and how do I increase my kindness and keep it forefront? You know, words matter, right? And words shape thoughts and feelings and behavior. And so we can think that we can just say things about people and it doesn't influence how we behave towards them. And so 
even up until last week, I was at a church that, you know, this language of us versus them, this language of um, we are chosen and they are secular. We are godly and they are ungodly because of a difference in belief, right? It's so harsh in its existence that if you internalize that, then you become harsh. That's just how human behavior operates. Um, and so I think when we root our identity in this language that then creates an inferiority complex, there is no other way for us to operate than to be unkind to people and how we think about them, see them, speak of them. Um, and, and so it is very much inside Christ. I didn't speak about people in these ways or, or think about people in these ways, right? But for some reason, we this is a part of just our norm, our function and our culture, and we've normalized it and spiritualized it and utilize scripture to support it without seeing that this sort of behavior, this sort of way of thinking about people is unkind. And that what separates us on a human level from anyone else that, you know, our beliefs differ and, and that's it. But in terms of existence, experience, you know, there are so many similarities that kindness is the, minimal of what we can do, we can be. And I think it really will call for us to reshape our identity. When God says that I have people of other folds, you know, we, we forget that part. We don't use the part of the scripture. No, we mm -hmm. are the remnant, right? And so I just think it's embedded within Adventist culture. I remember growing up, I was Methodist growing up. I grew up in a village back home. And Adventists were so separated from us in the village. The children were so separated. Um, there was, and, and, and as I later became Adventist, I became to understand that this is a part of the culture. You pull your way yourself away from, you consider yourself different or special or better in ways that really doesn't replicate how Christ did it, right? Um, and so I, I think it is in our DNA be unkind in many ways um mm. and it will require of us to intentionally want to be different and want to shift the dna and change the culture mm. that's that's crazy you said it's in our dna that's wild um yeah that's wild. but i i do agree with you shifting shifting the culture is is something that i believe in and shifting the culture is something that i I've, I've i've been doing on my own, I think, my own personal uh, uh, journey, um, mm -hmm. trying to do that for m me and my family. Uh, and, and I've seen that even in doing those things, like you said, there's been, there's been some resistance. You know, people have said certain things, they've whispered certain things. I don't care about any of those things at all. Um, I, I fear no man, right? Yeah. But I do think it's interesting that this is even a thing. And it, 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 it has become something that I think has it has made others who were thinking about either coming back to the church or checking out the church in general to say, oh, wait, what's happening? No, I'm not about that. And going and going other ways. And, and that to me is sad because it's not even about the message, right? It's not even about Christ per se. It's really about right. people and, and the culture that the people, that we as people have, have now assumed that this is going to be what we do. And I, I have so many problems with that. But I think that there can be hope because I think that there are people like you who are going out there and just pointing out the truths of, of what's really happening, right? I think for such a long time, there, there was not a lot of talk about culture in terms of church, right? It's just been about, this is church yeah. and church is this way, which church is a certain way, but so much of church, yes, is the Bible, but there's so many things that are culturally driven that are not biblical that we now have assumed also means church and at the same exactly. time that is that's not a thing this is now we created this thing this this is now what the culture of this church is versus that church and you know etc but that's not a biblical thing and i think that gets in the way of someone wanting to get closer to to god or christ now we're talking about not so much the bible and in christ we're talking about us 
And and that can be very, very confusing, especially for someone who's coming in who hasn't been, you know, in this thing as long as you and I, and they're looking at this thing as, oh, this is this is not this is not what I'm trying to get down with. This doesn't make any sense to me because I, on the outside, I have so many connections with people, but you're saying now I, I can't connect with anybody. What sense does that make? And right. that's confusing. And just to add a practical example of what that looks like, because this came alive for me just last week. I was at a church who had just finished an uh, um, evangelistic series. This was literally the Sabbath after it ended, and the new converts are in the congregation. And the pastor's sermon centered on, and he made a comment saying, you know, back in the day before someone got baptized, we would go to their house and check their fridge and look in their closets to make sure that they are ready. And there was someone who would say, no, baby, you're not ready yet. No, you're not ready yet. And I thought about the juxtaposition of new converts sitting in the congregation, hearing this as a norm of Adventist culture, right? And what it means and how contradictory, how contradictory it is to the message of love and acceptance of Christ. Now, I, am I fearing that someone's going to come search my house? ensure that I am ready enough, that I am Christian enough, that I really, that I'm Adventist enough to choose Christ, right? And so the harm is layered, it's embedded, it's coming from multiple levels, and it's doing so much um, on, on just a practical level of how we separate, how we create this sort of unkind version of Christ that isn't how he works and operated or even called us to work and operate. Yeah. And so it's really layered. Yeah, that's that's crazy, but I'm not surprised. And I, I think the 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 issue like you're saying is, you know, where, where do we go? How how do you rectify this? How do you how do you change culture? How do you change culture mm -hmm. in an environment that has been so spread out and has been allowed to be certain ways for such a long time where you know, the, the the newer generations like you and I and even, you know, those coming after us, I, you know, I, I think about the internet and the internet's been an amazing thing, also a crazy bad thing in so many <laughs> other, other ways, but it has been successful in, in kind of pointing out certain truths, right? And fact checking certain things. There were so many times where someone can just say whatever they wanted from a pulpit or even from a stage, even at work, right? And there was no way to fact check anything, but now, People are like, yeah, that's not true. Mm, I don't yeah. believe that. No, 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 no. Yeah. what you're saying is not accurate, <laughs> right? So it, it comes down to yes, we're, we're we're smarter. We're smarter. People are thinking. They're actually using their brains. They're 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 rationalizing. They're understanding where they have been, where they are, and where they want to go. And I don't think that we're in a space now where you know the do as I say, not as I do thing is 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 relevant anymore. We're in a place where it's like, yeah, whatever we're saying, we have to do. If we're saying that God is love, then we have to be love. And, and, and it, can't, it can't be about, oh, well, you know, this is how I am. And this is, uh, you know, so many excuses you put out here and so many justification you put out here for why we do certain things. But no, the facts of the matter are, let's just be what we say we are. Let's just do what we say we want to do. And I think for me, that's how you really draw people in. That, that's how others who have, have been doing this for, even outside of our direct denomination, you know, other, other bodies of faith, that's what they do. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's simple kindness, simple acts of kindness, simple messaging uh, uh, and, and it's c concise to the point that people are, are moved by the simplicity and the transparency of it. Yes. And I, I think for me, that, that's, that's, that's the hard part. So, you know, Doc, I, I, I got to ask you how you, the work that you do, right? Um, how do you reconcile your work with so many factors we just talked about culture and tradition and the modern norms and all these different things? How do you recognize and reconcile the work you're doing to make an impact on not just the church, but also the clients that you see, today's society, those who are, are struggling with the racial trauma outside and then come to you or come to places of faith looking for reconciliation, looking for safe spaces, but also feeling like those spaces are not spaces where they can share because there's judgment, there's a lack of love even there. So where do you go? Where, what do you share with them is the best way to deal with the things that are happening in today's society. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, 
I am human. Let nothing human be alien to me. And that for me is my sort of guide in anywhere that I am, anyone that I interact with in that moment. It is, can my humanity touch their humanity? Can their humanity touch mine? And that's the only thing that matters, right? When us, when our humanity meets each other. And so I think less about the spaces and I'm, you know, I've tried to curate multiple different types of spaces to Mm -hmm. do the work. And I've tried to, you know, do it through my own practice and do it through all these different means. And it all has its impact. And I, continue to come back to the most powerful piece is when your humanity meets mine and what we can exchange in that moment and that's the moment and that's the space and that's the interaction that matters and everything else is just supplemental um and so I just exist now in a way where that's the focus and that's the core that every conversation every encounter becomes the opportunity to see people and to be seen um, and to ensure that people feel leaving, heard and seen wherever that occurs. Mm. And less about trying to hope that the church becomes a particular place or hope that the institution becomes a particular place because we don't have control over any of that. The only control we have is over ourselves. And I think that has released a lot of my frustration and, and holding on Mm. and freed me to engage the work from a different place and a different way. Um, and so I think that's sort of my my approach now. I try to hold hope as um, a part of my core and, and I try to say, you know, I'm hopeful. I hope for this, I hope for that. Yeah. And while those things happen and I hope those things happen, All I have right now, and many times, all I have is a moment, Mm. right? And I think some of that comes from my work and work in crisis. And, you know, all you might have is one moment, one interaction to be the difference between someone choosing to do something really scary. Um, And so it is no longer about the institutions and all the big spaces or what could happen after. It's just about that moment. Um, and that's really just revised my approach to this entire thing. Mm. Yeah, no, that's big. You know, I, 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 I think that I connect with that in a, a variety of ways. We've started a number of different groups, um, a running club, a workout group, all these different things that have really been these smaller environments, these smaller groups yeah. where people can connect and they can um, bond and talk and, and, and have those spaces where, yes, now they're sharing, now there's more support there. That's beyond the one day, right? It's beyond the two hours. It's really an ongoing weekly, yearly experience where you're connecting with people in a different way. And, and I do think I've seen more growth. I've seen more connection. I've seen more, even more Christ sometimes in those spaces uh, than in the two hours that we may spend, you know, inside a certain building. Uh, or even the conversations that are happening after those two hours, right? The conversation where people are sharing what the week was like or the, the calls that I may get from a friend during the week talking about his situation with his kid or whatever else. And, and I was praying in that moment, those things have been a little more beneficial for me to say, okay, well, th- this is what it is, right? The, the, the inspiration during, during the, the certain day is great, but when it comes down to it, when someone, like you said, has crisis or trauma, when they're going through something and they reach out or call out in that moment where they're connecting and you're sharing a word with them or a scripture with them or a prayer with them and their life may be changed for the good or for the worse in that moment, that's the moment. Like that's, that's more important than anything else. So I agree with you. I, I think it's, it's the structures are there. They're going to be there. I, I also have hope to an extent that uh, we can, we can be better. We can do better, but I, I do think it will take time to change the cultural things. And I just hope that there's more spaces like this, like what you're doing um, with ASJ, what you're doing with your own work and, and others just to put out there, uh, you know, what's, what's really happening. I, I think that the generation coming up behind us is, is one that doesn't have time for fluff and, and mm-hmm. see and sees through so many things easily. Yes. My daughter in yes. particular, she'll look at me and say, daddy, dad, you know, whatever she'll say to me, I'm like, oh, how, girl, what do you, how'd you, what are you seeing? <laughs> what are you seeing? How do you know this? Like, daddy, I know you. I'm like, what do you, and I'm, she's right. She mm-hmm. knows, she sees right through me. 
yeah. and they're smart. And the, 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 those who are coming up in, in today's environment, whether it's SCA church or other forms of Christianity or other faith walks, they're smart. You know, there, there's no, there's no sugar coating. They'll look right through somebody and know if that person's a kind person or not. They'll look right through somebody and know if that person has an ulterior motive or not, or if they're actually living what they say, you know? So I think that our generation didn't always have that. We kind of say, oh, well, you know, it's all good. This person is that, you know, they're the pastor, the elder, you know, there's a certain prestige that comes with that. So no matter what happens, they could do no wrong. But this generation right now, they don't care about any of that stuff. They're like, yo, you're mean. (laughs) And they are a gift to us. Lucky us that we have this generation to let us see ourselves. Yeah. Right. And to cut through that fluff. Yeah. We may not like it. It's hard. You know, your daughter's with, I only have a six month old. So imagine when she gets to your daughter's age. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. The level of just transparency. But lucky us that we have a generation that's willing to call us out on all the things that we have comforted ourselves with mm-hmm. that don't actually matter and that's not right. And I believe that Gen, Gen Z and Alpha generation will be the generation to get us to where God wants us to be mm-hmm. because we have to see ourselves. They will be our mirror on how we change and if we choose to change. Yeah, that's big. Listen, Doc, last question for you. I've asked everybody on the show how they have been or want to be more in 2024. I know we're in September and the year is winding down. We're in the last quarter of the year. So how have you been or how have you wanted to be more for yourself, for your business, for your family, in all ways, in one way, whatever, in 2024? Yeah, this year has been a reset year for me. Um, I had a baby in January, so... I have been going through it (laughs) Um, in terms of just my entire identity and focus reshifting, you know? Um, I think I have been refocusing on the spaces that make me feel fulfilled, the things that make me feel fulfilled, um, the impact that I want to leave in this world. Sounds a little but I've been sharing with friends that going to funerals for me in this year has been transformative. It's almost not that I enjoy that people have died, but it's become, a, I don't want to say a favorite activity of mine, but a space that really calls for me to be in deep introspection because I've gone to so many funerals and just listening to people's legacy and mm. impact um, and and hearing stories and so in this year funerals have helped to transform how I think about my work in that am I actually leaving an impact am I actually changing anything um what is my legacy am I doing anything that's purposeful and so that's caused me to cut out a lot of the fluff a lot of the frivolous things and really zoom in on my family, zoom in on my community, and even on my gifts, right? Because everything is in for every time. And so in 2024, what is the impact that I want to leave? And that's been my focus. So that's sort of how I've been trying to show up and be more in 2024. Um, and it's been it's been purposeful. It's felt, it's felt good to be in that space. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that as well. Funerals for me are, it's always a, a time for a reset. Mm-hmm. So I, I think you taking that time to really self-reflect and analyze is is great. Um, I haven't taken my daughter to many funerals in general, just because I mean, a lot of questions come with that. And, and yeah. I, I'll do that at some point in time. But for me, yeah, I, I've, I've gotten the same. I haven't gone to many this year, but the ones I went to this year so far have been that, that same kind of feeling for me so i definitely mm-hmm. resonate with that resonate yeah with that. doc again where can people follow you uh to connect with you either with your your business uh with asj if they want to help out with that in any regard or just to kind of follow you on social media or your website again one more time yeah, so we have a Venice for social justice we have a facebook group um i'm on facebook tiffany llewellyn sometimes i'm causing trouble on there sometimes i'm not <laughs> um, and my practice info at wellness.org, or tlwellness.org. 
Awesome. Awesome. Doc, you made episode one for the books. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for making the time. Congrats on being a new mom. And uh, yes, I look forward to having you back on the show again sometime soon. Maybe to talk about the change you've seen in our church communities over time. We'll see what the rest of this year into next year looks like. But I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. Folks, she said so many poignant things. And, you know, our, our talk today was really just about transparency. We, we both love our church. We both love Christianity. We both love helping people in any place, whether it's uh, our church body or another church body or another faith organization or even a business, right? Even my job. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. Each place is going to have their own issues, their own issues in terms of being more effective for the people that they're serving. But I do think it does come down to us trying to make sure that we're serving our people the best way possible, whether that's inside the, the four walls of a church community or a mosque or a synagogue or uh, the four walls of a PT clinic or even the four walls of her private practice. We have to make sure we're serving our people correctly, efficiently, so they can show improvements to be better for themselves and for each other. And we can't really do that unless we're honest with each other about where we are, where we're trying to go, and the things that can hold us back from, from getting there. So like the quote said today, we cling to the wreckage of the past for fear of the uncharted future. But by letting go, we open our hands to receive what life has to offer. Let's open up our hands this week uh, and this month and even the rest of this year as we go into the end of 2024 to receive more. Uh, letting go of things that may have gotten in the way, the cultural things that may sometimes get in our way, the... The, the lack of transparency, the lack of conversation that may get in the way also, and really look forward to making sure that those coming behind us can have a better chance to be successful, to be more, not just in 2024, but for the rest of their lives. Until next time, folks, have a great day, have a great night, have a great life, and I'll see you for our next episode. Peace.